Just a little bit about me, um, in case you guys don't know. I've been in C++ for about 20 years. I, I used to lead the IBM C++ compiler um, as a team lead. And, um, and since then, I've been mostly doing strategies, um, technical analysis, research, bordering on, um, on sort of the bleeding edge. So as a result, that's why I'm here at the Standard Committee for many, many years. Um, over the years, I've kind of moved from different, into different areas. I love going to um, concurrency because I find I learn a lot from different people. Many of you guys in the room, I see uh, uh, you know, that left here, so, um, um, and other people. So I, find, I found it extremely rewarding, and that's why I'm hoping to, to bring this to you. Um, so there, there, I, I'm going to start now. Yep, so there is a lot of people to acknowledge and thank you. There's, not in, there's just not enough uh, room on the page to, 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 to say that. Um, a lot of this do come from many different sources, many different people. Um, least of, most, of, most of all, my own, my own mentor, Paul McKenney, who's going to come up after me um, to talk about probably the most complex area. I'm going to talk about something a little less complex, but nevertheless, no less interesting. Um, there are going to be errors in this. Um, there are going to be errors in these slides. One of my old instructors says, you know, if there aren't any errors, then I wouldn't be doing any doing my job because you, one of your jobs is to find those errors. And to be honest, you couldn't. It couldn't hurt if you're told a few things that are wrong. However, if there are any errors that remain, they are mine, um, um, including stupid mistakes, um, things like that in my transcription attempt. There's the usual legal disclaimer. My division used to be called rational, so I thought it might be interesting to call it irrational. <laughs> so why are you here? And this is essentially the simple agenda here. I only have three things to talk about. Why are you here? What is the multi-threading support in C11 and C++11? And the memory model, the gory details. I took this quote actually from Bianna's book, where he, where he started the memory model chapter itself. And I thought it's kind of appropriate, so let's see if it stays true as we go along. So why are you here? I like to think that you might want to find out um, how to make things go fast. You might want to find out how to make things to be productive, but also make it portable. But you also want to make things go, be correct. I think the gentleman yesterday, Fid Fiddle, said that one of the fastest parallel programs he can make is one that, doesn't, that is incorrect. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I, want to think of, I want you guys to think about that for a moment in a slide or so. But why am I here? The reason I'm here is to motivate why we have a memory model. I want to teach the memory model, because in teaching it, I actually learn a lot about it. It's true. If you want to learn something, try think about teaching it. Um, performance is going to be the main reason why we have a memory model. Otherwise, why would you do parallel programming? Yes, its correctness is important. The question that, that, that many people are asking um, is can you, can you still do parallel program, uh, programming and make it correct, but do it easier? And this is a still ongoing debate in the industry. You have heard the claim that parallel programming is hard. I gave a keynote just earlier this year in um, Karlsruhe where I claimed parallel programming isn't that hard. Okay. Um, and the way to make it less hard is to bring the tools to where it is where it is, and teach them what it really means. At one point, driving a Model T Ford car was hard. Okay? Imagine, you know, I don't have a picture, but I had it in my keynote. The, 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 the accelerator wasn't at your foot. It was actually beside you. Okay? Imagine if you got into a car like that, see if you could actually drive it. And yet today, you know, I have a car that has like a billion functionalities. It can actually drive itself. It actually follows the lane because it's got cameras and radars and all that. You know, complexity ha ha um, vastly has, um, has increased. And yet I have no trouble driving this car. Okay? Parallel programming might be viewed in the same way. Okay? I would claim that for the C++ memory models, the goal of it is that maximum perform. It's really trying to get in for maximum performance, but still portability. And as such, these, I would claim, are some of the, what I call the iron triangle of parallel programming language nirvana, based on a book by Paul McKenney that he has online, where he says that the three main goals of parallel programming over and above sequential programming is performance, productivity, and generality, what I call portability. 
And the reason it's an tri iron triangle is if some of you guys are team leads, a technical leader, you know that it's very hard to get those three to, to, to achieve a peak, a peak value. You always have to give up on one of them. If you have performance you pro and generality, you probably lose some productivity. If you have productivity and portability, you probably lose performance. Okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. And some of you are going to ask right away, really? What about correctness, maintainability, robustness, and so on? And I would say that these are important goals, and they are just as, but they're just as important for sequential programming as they are for parallel programs. And therefore, important though they are, they do not belong on a list specific to parallel programming. Okay? This is my view, not necessarily the correct view. I, I just ask you to entertain it. And if correctness, maintainability, and robustness don't make the list, why do productivity and generality? Well, I would say, and this is something that Paul taught me, was that given that parallel programming is perceived to be so hard and sequ over, over sequential programming, productivity is tantamount and therefore has, cannot be omitted. High productivity, high, high, highly productive parallel programming environments like SQL servers serve a very special purpose, hence generality has also to be added to the list. Okay. Enough motherhood and apple pie. Let's do a test. <laughs> I know, you didn't expect a test right off. So is this valid C++ today, and are these equivalent? Almost immediately, any time you're asked questions like that at a presentation, it's a, it's a rhetorical question, okay? And some rhetorical questions, the answer is always no, except in this case, yes, it is yes, they are valid C++ today. They differ slightly in that one is um, a, a, uses a free function syntax with memory ordering in red, you can see. The other one uses a natural C++ syntax, and yet it's still, it's, it, and that's still underneath is uh, atomic operations. The key you'll notice is that they both have an atomic variable Y. Okay. You may not know about atomic, or you're saying, well, this is why I showed up here to learn about it, but you can see the word atomic right there, and that should get your ears up right away. It says that these two programs are actually identical in terms of, well, in terms of what? What do you mean they're equivalent? Do you mean they behave the same, or do they have the same performance? Okay. Let me just describe what this program does. In this program, X is not atomic, Y is atomic, and you use Y to synchronize the access to X. What it means is it guarantees that the assignment to X is going to become visible. So as a result, um, the assertion X equals 17 will fire in both programs. However, so as a result, I, you, would, you would claim that they are equivalent in terms of functionality and behavior. But that's about as far as it goes. The, be the performance could be vastly different depending on what platform you're running this on. Right, Della? <laughs> Why is that? Well, just as a teaser, I, I can tell you right now that this one might run faster on power or ARM or, I don't know, Itanium maybe, um, where, the, where it specifically uses a, uses a weaker acquire release ordering. Whereas this one, because of the default that has been built into the C++11 specification, uses a much stricter, very strong, sequentially consistent ordering. You can't see it, and it's actually masked by the fact that it uses natural syntax, which is what you like to do. It means that if you do nothing, you don't do anything about adding ordering, specific ordering requirements, you're going to get the slowest behavior possible on most machines. The that's not a bad thing, by the way. In some respect, the standard did that deliberately so that it makes things easier to understand for programmer understanding. It makes it maybe easier to debug. Okay? And certainly on a simple program like this, you go, oh, I, I can understand this, right? And what it says is that if you are trying to improve the performance of your, your system, you have to look for these specific keywords, and they, work, they, they come out like, like, I don't know, like searchlights when you're looking for them. You find them almost immediately, and, and, you, and immediately you're, tuned, you're, you're tweaked into the thought that, hey, something's going on here. I better look really carefully. 
If you don't find those keywords, you know you're using sequential consistency. This is a, there is a beauty to, to that particular design. Some people don't agree with it. I actually don't quite agree with it, but you know, I've, I've learned to live with it too, okay? So con atomics, concurrency in C++ 11, 14, and 17. It's, it's a lot to, to put into one slide, but here it is. 99903 um, had, this to say about threads. What did Fiddle do? He go. <laughs> it just didn't have anything to say about threads. C11 and C11 is the first draft that have multi-threading support. And as such, they contain actually a whole bunch of stuff. And the only thing I'm interested in talking about today is the thing, other things in red. Memory model and atomics API. C11 chose to depart somewhat differently by adding a, a qualifier, an, atomic qual an underscore atomic qualifier, okay, um, which, which really makes me uh, upset, but I, I'm not going to get into that too much. Um, C14 enhanced the memory model now with better definition of lock free versus obstruction free. It clarified the, the atomic signal fence. It improved on something called out of thin air results. Um, and it realized that consume ordering as described was problematic and maybe unimplementable since no one has tried and been able to implement it. And hence Paul McKenney's work on improving on it, which he will tell you right after this talk. C++ 17, we started talking about defining uh, strength ordering for memory model to clarify what it means to be stronger or stricter or between one memory model to another. And we also started talking about, we also have things like execution agents, atomic views, and better SC models, potentially. Um, I don't want to talk about that at this, at this talk. Because some of you guys might come in, are coming in here with a certain frame of mind that I don't really know anything, I really want to learn a little bit. Other, uh, some of you guys are experts, and there's a whole bunch of people in between. And I want to see if I can give a little bit to everyone. So, Sequential consistency started off um, by a gentleman named, um, I don't know if he started, but I think he's pretty close to the, the, the first one, Leslie Lamport. Um, essentially, this is all, all it is saying is that we really want the system to be sequentially consistent. Um, being sequentially consistent means, hey, system, do what I told you to do. Don't do anything different. Unfortunately, the fact of it is that um, there's nobody on this planet builds SC systems. They haven't done it for a long time and they probably never will again. That's pretty much my best crystal ball analysis for today. <laughs> so a quick tutorial. What does this mean? The semantic, so in an abstract machine, these four statements here are to be executed one after the other in this exact sequence. And this is the specification of C99 and C++ 98. This is okay because we know that even though the statements has to be executed as if they're sequenced in program order, the optimizers can reorder them. And in this example, any of four, I only have four instructions here, any of four factorial possible ordering are, po are possible outcomes. In general, we generally agree that the old C and C++ specification allows sufficient reordering freedom for the optimizer and the hardware, but the old standard only applies to a single thread, so it can get away with that. The problem is how to specify the semantics of a multi-threaded program. This was at a point in 2005 when we first started meeting, and when I first started coming to this group and trying to understand what this means. Now, if we apply the old semantics to these two threads, the statements within each thread have to be executed as if they're in the above sequence for the moment, okay? Let's say we don't use any optimizations, uh, no reordering of any kind, okay? Since the two threads run in parallel, we still have a set of possible sequence of events from an actual execution. Now, here we show one such sequence, okay? Now, notice that within each thread, we still essentially have strict sequential ordering. Each, sequ each execution sequence might yield a different result. Now, suppose these statements actually are in two different compilation units, and one for each thread, and we allow the optimizer to op optimize them. In addition, we would say we will allow the optimizers to use the old semantics in C, C++11, the old standard. So within each compilation unit, we get four factorial possible ordering. And the optimizer is allowed to use any of these. 
If we take this resulting code and then run it in two threads in parallel, we're going to end up with a very large set of possible execution sequences. Our problem when we started designing the memory model was how to limit this set. Here I just showed two or four, poss four factorial possible sequences. Now add fences to it. Fences make good neighbors, so fences are here in this case, I use a very simple one as, as, as fences defining what, what's called both acquire and release semantics. So this means that no statements can be reordered past a fence. And this, only apply, this applies within a thread, of course. So this is because we want the optimizers to optimize the code in each thread without knowing the code in the other thread. Now, this is an important point because it's the key in our attempt to restrict the possible reordering. So we restrict how the optimizer can reorder statements in one thread without ever knowing what code is in the other threads. Okay? And the purpose of this restriction is to give the programmer some certainty in the results of the executions. So we reorder this, obeying the fence semantics, and then we run the resulting code in parallel. We're going to end up with a set of possible results. But this set now is yet smaller than it would be if the reordering was wide open, as it was in the previous slides. Furthermore, we can now make some assertions now, finally, because the previous slide, anything is possible. Here, I can actually claim that if R3 equals 1, that implies R4 equals 1. How does that happen? Well, if R3 equals 1, then we know that R, over here in thread 2, R3 equals 1, obtain the value of y from y equals 1 over here. That means that if y equals 1 was executed by virtue of the fence, x equals 1 must have been executed before then. It must have happened before the y equals 1. And therefore, down, going, coming back here in thread 2, in R4 equals x, you would achieve the one result. Okay. I'll leave it as an exercise for the audience as to how to, say, how to, how to figure out that if R1 equals 1, it implies R2 equals 1. Just look at it, and you'll start seeing it. Sometimes you just stare at these things long enough. That's what I did for a while. <laughs> Got it? Thank you. So, memory ordering. You know, when I first started writing programs, I never knew the CPU reordered my code. I mean, what? You'd actually change my code? How dare you? <laughs> now, I, I don't even think about it. I, I, I actually would have that reaction if you didn't change my code. <laughs> what? How dare you? You didn't make it faster? <laughs> Believe it or not, many games programmers come from that point of view more than the, uh, the original point of view. They expect the CPU to reorder, to, to reorder their code. They expect things to be weak. They actually expect things to start off weak, and then they start adding, adding uh, refinements into it in order to make it strong enough so that they can tell what's going on. I learned this, actually, by hanging out with the SG14 crowd. Um, so essentially, what is, a memory, what is a memory model? Well, Sustrup actually had a really good word to say it. He says it's a contract between the implementers and the programmers to instruct to, to ensure that most programs do not have most programmers do not have to think about the details of the modern computer hardware. Paul tells me that it's a critical it's a critical component of concurrent programming. So in order to understand that, I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at what cache coherency means. Um, it's, I thought I spent a lot of time doing these, doing those those diagrams. So I thought I might as well show it. My, some of you guys might already know what this is, but let's start off with the idea of thread switching. You guys, most of you guys have known about thread switching. I, this, I actually saw this in um, actually Maurice Hurley's book. Actually, so this is credit to him. I liked it. Thread switching is like you working in an office, and when you leave for lunch, someone else takes over your office. But if you never leave your office and you stay there too long, the security guard comes and escorts you away to the, to the cafeteria, to the bathroom. And then when he escorts you back, he might put you in a different office. <gasps> I like that. I thought you should see that. <laughs> so a typical cache, in a typical cache-based machine, this is what it might look like. If it's super, super scalar, then it can produce more than one result. And at the time I did it, um, 
I, at the time I was doing these slides, which was actually almost five years, 10 years ago, the fastest memory has latency of 60 nanosecond, and the cache, of course, is faster. It's still not as fast as the CPU would like it. And as the technology strings, you can put more cache on the chip. Um, you know, technologies loves to be, love to be helpful. They want to put cache in there so you can improve your latency of access and things like that. In reality, the memory hierarchy is much more complicated. It looks something more like this, that, such that there's an L2 cache, off die, there's an in integrated um, L1 cache, which is separated into an instruction cache, a translation look, look outside buffer, which is an address cache, a data cache, and things like that. Um, but the, what you really are interested in, and by the way, Paul, I, I took this from your book as well too, so thank you for giving me the permission. I thought it was cute. It talks, it talks about the, the toll booth cause of a cash miss, okay? And so here, what we have is essentially, when the CPU needs some data, the system's gonna identify a line in the memory, and even if you only need a byte of data of it, they will get the whole line for you, so helpful. The, <laughs> the cache is a partial image of the main memory, and the cache line starts as part of a page. It's gonna move from memory to L2 and then to L1, and quite naturally, um, it's gonna have, there could be multiple copies of this floating around um, in your thing, but you see how fast it goes at the end. This is what they want, right? Now, in order to understand what it costs to have a cache miss, this it's a picture gives you an idea that when cache line starts in memory, multiple copies will exist over time. And this is what generally is the call of the cache coherency mechanism. Um, CPU zero has a piece of data, the brown piece, that it wants to write over into the cache. And when it does that, because there's, there's a copy of this cache line in CPU two and three, the system now has to essentially invalidate um, all these other ones, okay? And then it continues its journey to the main memory. Now you can safely remove the invalidation on the main memory itself. But now CPU says, well, I, I need a copy of that. Ask the cache, do you have a copy of, of it? And the cache says, well, I do, but it's stale. Ah, oh, no, now I have to get it from main memory. <laughs> And so the journey begins to main, from main memory, and finally the invalidation goes away. So you might ask, what does this have to do with Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein? Actually, after doing enough presentation, I realized everything in life has to do with Albert Einstein. <laughs> it, it, he comes back all the time, I'm telling you. It's, 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 he's a, that's why he's, he's amazing. Well, apparently there was a talk, and Stephen Ta Hawking was, uh, was shown about this cash coherency business. Um, in computer science, and he says, the two biggest, you know what your two biggest problem is? Um, it's, the, it's the finite speed of light. You're just, you're just really, you're just under the thumb of the speed of light. It's about 386,000 um, meters per second square, I think, or, or something like that. But there's no way to go faster than that. And the other thing is, of course, the atomic nature of matter, okay? And again, I want to thank Paul for some of these, some of these, these diagrams. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> oh, your, oh, your daughter, Melissa. <laughs> So, what is a memory model? We've already talked a little bit about that. Um, there's some aspects of a memory model that I'm particularly interested in, but one of the things that you should know is that it's one of the most important aspects of C++ 11. Yes, you heard that from me. Not all value references, not template alias, <laughs> not variadic templates. <laughs> from my point of view, and many of you, many of you that, that are my colleagues in SG1, we think this is the most important aspects of, of C++11, and yet it's the most hidden aspects, okay? It tells you how threads interact through memory, and it, it, and it tells you what assumptions the compiler is allowed to make when generating code. The memory models generally will tell you two aspects, how is memory laid out, okay, and what happens when two threads interact and access the same location, and one of them is trying to change it. For me, when I was learning this, I was always told a couple of things. You know, it was always about atomicity, visibility, and ordering. And I'm gonna go back to that again, especially when we start talking about relaxed memory ordering and fences. So currently, what we have is essentially a loosely coupled shared memory. 
when you, want, when you write a variable, if you think that every thread will see it instantly, you're wrong, as demonstrated by Albert Einstein. There is no such thing as faster than light. Optimization will change the results, so this effectively inhibits it. Normal reads and writes are local to your thread until they're communicated somehow to other threads. So there's going to be, still going to be some lag. There was always a question as we were designing this was, can you use volatile to do that? You can't, it turns out. We, we were hoping, we tried. Um, I'll talk about the, the reason for that later on, okay? So what we ended up, if you, to help you think about the, the C++ memory model, I like to think of it as a message shared um, memory. Um, when you, you have two threads and they want to talk to each other, I should have drawn a diagram of this too, it would be fun. One thread writes, one thread writes, I essentially held in limbo until you write, an at, write to an atomic variable or acquire a lock. Those now get communicated until another thread accessing the same place picks those writes up. So a thread, when it writes to the atomic variable, says, I'm ready to release all my writes to this variable. And then a second thread wants to do an acquire from that variable, and then all the writes from one thread are now visible to the second thread. That's all it is. And here I'm, gonna, I'm showing you a few explicit way of creating a, a read or write um, using um, with memory ordering, just a glimpse of what it looks like. I want to go over in pretty good detail about what all these mean. One of, I told you that one of the things that the, 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 specif the memory model did was to tell you how memory is laid out. So one of the first things we did was specify what is a memory location. It turned out it wasn't that easy either. You, you think a memory location is pretty clear. But there were um, gotchas. The main one had to do with bit fields. You know, uh, adjacent bit fields in the same memory. I mean, I'm, I'm not glossing over the other. I mean, you can put in that much you know, an, integer, an integer, um, a charge, they, they're in different memory locations. But one of the main questions we had to ask was, you know, are bit fields, adjacent bit fields in, the, in, in the, a single memory location? Yes, they are, okay? Unless they're separated by a zero bit bit field, which allows them to be separated out into the next um, container boundary, okay? And the compiler won't do that for you. You have to do that. The other thing was that we had to define what a data race was, okay? It's pretty, it, it, these three statements work all together and you have to remember every word of it, okay? The key is that it has to be a non-atomic access. One of them has to be a write, okay? And there's no enforce ordering, which is what happens before means between them. And the result is going to be undefined behavior, meaning 3,000 golf balls will be shipped to your door on Wednesday. That is a perfectly well-defined well, well behavior. Other people have said it's called a catch fire semantics. I don't actually know the sources. Does that mean that your hair is on fire and you're running from the theater? I don't know. Maybe Paul can enlighten us on that one later on. All right. Now, the result is that for the compiler writers, me, um, there are a few things that, hap that happen. I'm, um, I actually, so just to, just, to su just to summarize, there are some rare uh, optimizations that are gonna be more restricted and some common optimizations that can be augmented. This is not a compiler audience for the most part, so I'm gonna skip past the slide. All right, so onto on the volatiles. We didn't, we didn't reuse the, word, the keyword volatile for atomics because there's just too much history on volatile. Volatile means certain things already to different compilers, different systems, okay? Um, and it's an, unfortunately, Java has, started, has already started using volatile as the keyword for, atom, for atomics. Um, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, so for the most part, you can have volatile atomics as well. It is possible to have an atomic, a volatile, int, okay? And that means that not only the atomic says, I could be changed by some other thread. The volatile says, um, something in the system, in the environment can change me, or in this case, in, a, in case of real-time time requirements, the compiler doesn't know about, um, so it further restricts the, the compiler's um, opportunities. And that's what happens in the Linux kernel. Now, there were some fundamental things we had to do to set the requirements for on atomics as we were designing it. We didn't want to worry about the thread starting before you initialize the atomic variables. So they had to be statically initialized. We didn't want atomic variables that are expensive on current hardware. 
So we enable, and we want to enable relative novice to write reasonable working code so without worrying about all the gory details. Unfortunately, I'm not entirely sure we succeeded in that. Um, experts, um, some of you guys in this room, can use this to write lock-free code. Generally, if you write something brand new, it's usually worth a PhD. That's how, that's how much work it, it is, and that's what it's worth. Okay. In the proposal, in, the, in, in C++, um, atomic types um, and operations are part of the library. In practice, nobody implements it as part of the library. It's in the library section because it's a fallback to enable you to implement them as, some, implement them as locks if you just can't get anything from your native system. In reality, the compiler implementer will implement these things as language is in the compiler itself. Very, very much like exception is in the library section, but it's actually part of the compiler's work. Now, there are three, there are, now, now we come, want to come to the idea of the consistency models. Um, we've already talked about sequential consistency, which is pretty easy. What is observed is consistent with a sequential ordering of all events in the system. We, we designed two weaker models, uh, which are more complex to code for some, but not to the gamers. They know how to code this stuff well. Um, but they're very efficient. And what we decided was that the default is sequential consistent, meaning if you don't say anything, or you use natural C++ expressions and syntax, like that pop quiz right at the beginning, you're gonna get sequentially consistent behavior. And we wanna allow the weaker semantics explicitly, okay? So for, you, for your choice, you have to make a choice. If too little ordering could break the program, too much ordering will reduce your performance, and there's always gonna be a balance that you will have to make a decision on. The C++ standard gives you that design flexibility. Most novices, I would advise to be conservative. Um, it's probably better to put in a little more ordering than you have to in order to make sure these things run properly and then slowly take it down. As you get better and better, then you will know how to remove them for performance. We, in the atomic design, we want shared variables that can be concurrently updated without introducing a data race, okay? That are atomically updated and read so that half updates are not allowed. As a result, we also want them to be, be paired closely with some of the hardware atomic read, modify, write operations that are out there. I've already, you guys already looked at this slide in terms of how a program, if it has a race, it has undefined behavior, okay? And by extension, it also means that the compiler generating your code, for the most part, it also, it also puts more restrictions on the invented rights that they might put on Okay, such that they could cause a race. We don't want the compiler to generate a race. We don't want you to generate a race either. Okay, and there's certainly possibly fewer speculative stores and loads. The atomic memory operations don't cause a race, or we, in another way to put it is they race, but they're very well defined. They might, they, they move ahead one, one or the other in a discrete unit. They, you never see a tear or split in between them. These atomics can be used to implement um, mutexes, locks, and they frequently are. And the fundamental idea here is that atomic operations is an indivisible operation. You can't observe a half-done result, okay? The flip side, of course, is that non-atomic operations, you can see half-done results through another thread. So this is, in this one chart, I'm showing you, mo I'm showing you all the different atomic types and what, how they're defined through the C++ standard under the header atomic, angle bracket, okay? You'll see that there's the atomic flag, there's atomic bool, a Boolean type. There are integral types, and then there are these, um, these, these um, uh, type depths that essentially mirror CST uh, dint. You'll notice that we don't have any floating point types or double types. More about that later on. <laughs> so let's build up what they look like in code. 
C++ has to deal with a large variety of hardware support. So standard is built around one primitive data type that you have to have hardware support for. And once you have that, it's going to build the rest of the environment. It's not going to be the fastest thing you ever saw, but it's enough, and that's going to be the role of atomic flag. The most, this is the most basic building block from which all the other atomic types could be built from if you didn't have that possibility. Okay? It's the only type that's guaranteed to be locked free. None of the other, the other are. Okay. If this atomic flag object has static storage duration, it's guaranteed to be statically initialized. Okay. It has about three operations, destroy, um, clear, um, and test and set, which is a re-modify uh, write operation. There are various things, copy construction or assignment from another atomic flag is not allowed, as with all the atomic types. This is mostly usable as a spin lock mutex but it's a poor choice if there's any contention if you actually try to use it. Now, it can't be used as a Boolean flag, though. This is the, this is the one to use. The bool is the one to use as a Boolean flag. Um, there's loads. So um, I do have slides that explain that, but I'm not going to explain too much um, after this that covers each particular one. Um, but each one of these have slightly different sets of operations. Um, they generally start off with bool having the smallest and with the integral types having the biggest set. The idea is that the standard said that they really only want you to, have, to use certain operations which made sense rather than allow you to have ac access to every single one, just, which is what the C, comp C, the, the C standard has done by using a qualifier on their fundamental type. They act, you could actually have an atomic float or double in C. I shudder every time I think about that because I'm wondering what happens if the representation changes or if there's a NAND in the middle of the atomic, what does that actually do? But anyway, the C++ has stopped you, this stops, stops such tomfoolery from actually ever happening. Maybe, it will hap maybe we'll allow it in the future once we've figured all this stuff out, but let's just not go there for now, okay? Student atomic bool has some interesting properties. Um, the only one I really want to focus on is atomic um, compare exchange weak. Okay? You can read about the rest on the slides. Atomic compare exchange weak is interesting because unlike atomic uh, compare exchange strong, um, exchange weak can fail spuriously. Okay? What does that mean? For the atomic exchange weak, uh, the stall might not be successful even if the original value was equal to the expected value, in which case the value, um, the value of the variable is unchanged and the return, val the, the return value of compare exchange weak is going to be false. How does this happen? This is most likely to happen on machines which might lack a single compare um, and exchange instruction. If the processor can't guarantee that the operations has been done atomically, possibly because the thread doing the operation was switched out in the middle of the necessary sequence of instructions, and another thread scheduled in its place by the operating systems, where there are more threads than processors, for instance, that's, that, that is how it happens. This is called a spurious failure, and since the reason for the failure is a function of timing rather than the value of the variables, um, then you have to put in a loop in order to keep checking, okay? In C++ 17, we started looking at this, and I think somebody in this room put out a bug report asking why, what does it mean that um, when you say one's, one memory ordering is stronger than the other one? And yes, we didn't say it. It's implied in the standard, but here it is. So the reason I zeroed in on compare and exchange weak is because these compare exchange operations interestingly have two memory ordering parameters, okay? This is allowed for the memory ordering, they are, this allows for the memory ordering semantics to be different in the case of success versus failure. On failure, only loads can happen. You have to reload, okay? So it might be desirable for this, so as a result, you have to actually have to specify two of them. And there's this specific um, uh, requirement that says that it is not permitted for um, you can't supply a stricter memory ordering for failure than for success, okay? So because of that, then um, if you want memory order acquire, 
all memory orders sequentially consistent um, semantics for failure, you have to specify those for success because they are the strongest you can get, okay? If you don't specify an ordering for failure, you have to specify those, uh, sorry, if you don't specify an order for failure, um, it's assumed to be the same as that for success, except that the release part of the ordering is gonna be stripped away because there is no store release happening here. It's just a load, okay, for the failure. So only the load, only the load ordering can be specified. So this interesting diagram drawn at the standard committee in Urbana last year tells you that um, Relax is weaker than release. Release is weaker than acquire release, which is weaker than sequential consistent. But there's a second path. Relax is weaker than consume, weaker than acquire, and then it bypasses release to go to acquire release, and then sequential consistent, okay? This is coming in C++ 17, but it's always kind of already in the standard. So I don't consider this a huge change, but it sort of makes things pretty uh, much clearer, okay? And these two statements are actually the same based on that, that strictness diagram, okay? The success here is acquire release, and the only one um, after that that is weaker than that is memory order acquire after that list up there. You can't use release because that's a store ordering for failure. And that's not possible for unfair. You have to, re you have to reload. At that. You have to load at that time. How are you guys doing? Are you guys with me so far on all this stuff? Good. I'm really impressed. You guys are great. All right. I don't have time to go through these, but essentially they just talk about the subtlety differences between each of the, inter the, each of the types, the integral types. The, the, you can have your own templated type as long as it's, it's trivial. You, have, you, know, you can have virtual functions and virtual bases and things like that inside your type. Um, we also made one more adjustment for atomic freedom. Um, there are properties that are associated with these. Um, so the standard has always called things lock-free without really defining it. There's, in, there's a re whole research literature that's associated with this. And the problem is what the standard actually talks about is actually uh, obstruction-free to some extent because we don't have the idea of a scheduler yet, okay? So we adjusted the standard to say that um, if there's only one unblocked thread, a lock-free execution in that thread shall complete. This is an acronym for that it's obstruction free, the word shall in this particular case. There's a second statement that says when one or more lock free executions run concurrently, at least one should complete. Notice the word should there. This is an acronym for lock free, okay? There is also the idea of wait free, which Fedor um, mentioned the, uh, the, the concept that operations completed in a bounded time. We don't really have a way to say much about that on the uh, in the standard. Every, uh, you know, it just, it just means that it won't take an arbitrary amount of time. The log free the one though, we do have many ways to deal with it. Um, there are large um, atomics that have no hardware support um, and they would require locks. So that's why you have to say whether these are log free or not. Um, locks and signals don't mix. That's another problem. So you have to test for lock free. And then for, we also have this compile time macro so that the preprocessor at, at preprocessing time can tell you whether you are always lock free, never lock free, and maybe lock free. <laughs> yes, because you don't know at runtime this actually can become lock free. So at that time, you have to do an RTTI request to find out whether it really is lock free, per instance. Yes. I'm not gonna talk too much about, um, th about that. All right, so let's get to the memory ordering operations. I, will, I wanna talk about each of these to some extent before and then leave the rest, leave, leave the hard stuff to, to Paul, which is gonna be consumed, okay? So sequential consistency. Um, there are act so the whole, whole, whole model really has, it's just three memory models, but there are six ordering constraints, okay? SC says it's a single total order for all SC operations on all variables. This is the default. Acquire, release, and consume is just a pairwise ordering rather than a total order. Independent reads and independent writes don't require synchronizations between CPUs. 
Relax Atomic says read or write data without ordering, and it still obeys that happens before relationship. Okay. Let's go into what these means. Oh, before we do, this is a table that tells you which operations work for which type. And you can see that it's very clearly that as you get into bigger and bigger types, the integral types, every operation is essentially available. Um, if you use your own type, which is the other type in this particular thing, we only supply uh, the log-free one, load store, exchange, and compare exchange weak and strong, because we really don't think that you can really do much with those, with, with those beyond those, those operations. Okay. But it makes sense that address operations have the increment and the, and the decrement operations, atomic operations on those for addressing. That only uh, um, increments the pointer, of course, not the actual data. OK. All right, so sequence points. Remember those? Yes, I know. I hated them because I never actually really understood what they meant. Where is the sequence point? Well, thank God they're gone. OK. Um, they're not. Well founded, there was lots um, that who didn't know what they meant, even in the standard itself. Now there are a couple of ordering relationships. There's a sequence before, which is a strong relation, sequencing relationship between operations. And then there's indeterminately sequence, which is a weak operation. It's either entirely before or entirely after. You don't know which, and I can't tell you which. That's the beauty of the standard. Okay. If you do a couple of writes or reads and a write and those operations are not defined by sequences ordering, then you will get undefined behaviors. That was the, that was the serial case. Now we try to extend the serial case, the acquire and release on variables, which gets picked up in another thread. We use an atomic variable, pick that up in another thread, and those operations are sequenced with each other across that connection in memory leading to what's called a happens before relationship. So sequence before is an intra-thread ordering. It works great in a single thread serial case. Then if you have multiple threads, then you have to get to the inter-thread relationship, which uses a synchronized relationship in the acquire and release. And then together, these guys can combine into what's a very useful relationship called happens before. Now, how does all this stuff work? There's, this is just words from the standard about sequence before and synchronized. I'm not interested in that. And again, you see that this is the definition of happens before. It says that for happens before relationship, the key is that A is sequenced before B, or A synchronizes with B, or for some evaluation X, A happens before X, and X happens before B. I want to put that into concrete terms as to what that might mean, okay? This is actually a reproduction from Fedor. I didn't ask you, but I hope you give me permission to. Thank you. Um, I found this slide interesting. This is one of the slides that talks about double check locking. And I looked into my slide deck, and lo and behold, I have the ex almost exact same slide, except I'm going ex to now explain the happens before relationship with double check lock, which I don't think he did. Thank you. So, I, so, so he didn't steal my thunder, so here I, here I go. There's a minor subtle difference here, which I'll tell you later on, but, it's, but, but if, you, if you flip back and forth, you'll see that he's got a, a, a load acquire at the top, and there is my load acquire at the very beginning, um, and then at the bottom, there's a store release, and you'll see that I have a store release. Now, in the middle, he has a non-atomic load, whereas I have an atomic load. That's actually a subtle thing that doesn't matter in this particular case. Most uh, non-atomic load can be replaced by an atomic load that's relaxed, okay, which is what this is. But, so the key that I want you to focus here in this particular exercise is that we've already said that it's undefined behavior to have non-atomic reads in number two, okay? Um, and writes in number three accessing the same data without an enforced ordering. So for double check locking to work, there has to be an enforced ordering somewhere. Oh, and by the way, just to make this tricky, this works because it's, it's the same, it's a different thread accessing the same code. That's why this is actually the same piece of code with different thread moving amongst them at different orders. That's what makes this tough to think about. It's not different code, which is what most examples use. So the required enforce ordering is actually pretty easy. It comes from the operation on stood atomic rule on x init. That's the only atomic, that's the only atomic in here. They provide the necessary ordering by virtue of the memory model relations happens before and synchronizes with. So here's how it works. The write of the data in number three is sequenced before um, the write to the x init flag in number four. And the read of the flag in number one is sequenced before the read of the data in number two. When the value read from x init in number one is true, 
the write to number four synchronizes with, that's in red, um, with the read in number one, and this, these, the green lines, sequence before lines, and the red synchronizes with line, creates a happens before relationship. And since happens before is transitive, the write to the data in number three happens before the write to the flag in number four, which happens before the read of the true value from the flag in number one, which happens before the read of the data in number, in number two. And there, my friends, we have an enforced ordering. Wow. Amazing that it works, right? This is why this now can become, this now has ordering in it, okay? If you didn't follow that, I'll give you another opportunity to follow it. Because I'm gonna explain the sequential consistent um, idea, okay? This is a fairly simple um, um, piece of code that tests sequential consistency. Um, we have a write of x in one thread. We have a write of y in one thread using SC, I'm doing it explicitly, I actually didn't have to write that, by the way. And I have a read of x and then a read of y in, uh, in a third thread, just to see, just to prove to myself which one got written first, okay? Was it x that got written first or was it y that got written first? And then I have another thread, fourth, the fourth thread, that reads it in the opposite order to see if I read, that's to see if y was written first before x was written. That's all this is doing. And this is an interesting uh, diagram that helps you to understand it. This is one possible total order. Um, it's not the only one, but in this diagram, the dashed line um, um, impl shows the implied ordering re relationships required in order to maintain sequential consistency. And the, um, right. Okay. And the sequence um, and the uh, solid lines indicates happens before, or if it's in the same thread, a sequence before relationship. So the loads in this diagram, the loads and stores to X and Y are explicitly tagged with memory orders sequential consistent. Um, we could have omitted that, of course. And, the, and I claim that the assert in number one cannot fire, can never fire, since either the store to X in number two or the store to Y in number three must happen first, even though it's not specified which. So if the load to Y, if the load to Y in read X then Y, that's number four, return false, then the store to X has to occur before the store to Y, in which case the load of X in read Y then X in number five has to return true. Since the while loop ensures that the y is true at this point, because that's, so that's why it's true. So the semantics of sequential consistency requires a single total order over all operations that are tagged with this SC ordering. So because of that, there's an implied ordering um, of relationship, implied ordering relationship between a load of y that returns false in number four and the store of y in number two. For there to be a single total order, if one thread sees x equals true and then subsequently sees y to be false, then this implies that the store to x occurs before the store to y. Now, because everything is symmetrical, it could also happen the other way around, such that the load of x in number five comes back as false, forcing the load of y in number four to come back as true. In both cases, z is gonna be one. Now, of course, both loads could return true. Yes, that is possible. And Z becomes two, but there's no possibility of Z being zero. Okay. I know, this takes a bit of winding to see, but this is the simple case. <laughs> Let me go to the next case, relax ordering. The Z is atomic, X and Y are atomic, okay? So everything is atomic here, okay? Now let's see how relax ordering works. This is a case of relax ordering. We have two uh, uh, cases here, write X then Y, and then we have read X then Y. Actually write X then write, then write Y, read X then read Y, okay? I always try to draw these little diagrams to help myself. So once you step outside the nice sequentially consistent world, things 
start to get complicated. Probably the single biggest issue to get to, to grip with is that there is no longer a single total order of events, single global order of events. That means that different threads can see different views of the same operations. And any mental model we have of operations from different threads neatly interleaving one after the other has to be now be totally discarded. Not only do we have to account um, for things happening truly concurrently, but threads don't have to agree on the order of, of events. In order to write any code that uses memory order other than the default, it's absolutely vital to get your head around this. Let me say it again. Threads don't have to agree on the order of events. So this is best demonstrated by stepping outside the comfortable world of sequential consistency and using um, relax. Okay. The operations on atomic types performed using relax don't um, participate in synchronizers with relationships. Operations on the same variable within single thread still obeys the happens before relationship. But there is almost no requirement here on ordering um, relative to other threads. So the only requirement is that access to a single atomic variable from a single thread from, a, from the same thread cannot be reordered. That's it. Once a given thread has seen a particular value of an atomic variable, a subsequent read by that thread cannot retrieve an earlier value of that variable. Without any additional synchronization now, the modification order of each variable is the only thing shared between threads that are using order relaxed. So how does this sequence work? Well, I would say here, the assert in number one can fire because the load of x in number two can read false even though the load of y in number three can read true and the storage of x in number four happens before the store of y in number five. x and y are different variables. So there are no ordering guarantees relating to the visibility of values arising from operations on each of these. The relaxed operations in different variables can be freely reordered provided they obey any happens before relationships they're bounded by within the same thread. So they don't, they don't introduce synchronizers with relationships. The happens before relationship here is shown, essentially, along with a possible outcome. Even though there is a happens before relationship between the stores and between the loads, there's not one between either store and either load. And so the loads can see the stores out of order. I know, it does take time. It took me hours and days before I finally thought I saw it. Can you go back to the previous slide? Hmm? Can you go back to the previous slide? Please? Absolutely. Okay. Let me go to something that will help you. I live in this world all the time, so for me now, this is almost natural. And for gamers, this is natural. <laughs> See how relax works. Anthony Williams taught me this. I loved it, so I had to use it, and I want to credit him for that. Imagine that each variable is a man in a cubicle with a notepad. On his notepad is a list of variables. You can phone him and ask him to give you a value, um, or you can tell him to write down a new value. If you tell him to write down a new value, he writes at the bottom of the list. If you ask him for value, he reads you a number from the list, anywhere from the list. The first time you talk to this man, if you ask him for value, he may give you any value from the list on his pad. And if you then ask him for another value, he may give you the same one again, or a value from further down the list that he got from someone else. Okay? He'll never give you a value further up the list. He'll give you either the number you told him to write down or a number below that on the list. So here in this case, we have a list 5, 10, 23, 3, 1, 2. The red and the green ones haven't been added yet. If you ask for a value, you could get any of these. He could give you 10. Then the next time you ask him, he could give you 10 again, or any of the later ones, but never five, because it precedes the one that he's already dispatched. If you call him five times, he might say 10, 10, 1, 2, 2, for example. Perfectly valid results on a, on a relaxed machine. Okay. If you tell him to write down 42, which is in red, He'll add it to the end of the list, and if you um, ask him for a number again, he'll keep telling you 42 until he has another number on his list. Now, let's imagine your friend Carl um, also has this chap's number, and Carl also phones him and asks him to write down a number 
um, or he asks for one, and he applies the same rules to Carl as he does to you. He has only one phone. He can only deal with you one at a time. Carl asks, you know. So, in effect, what he's doing is that if Carl, if Carl here um, would ask him for a number and was told 23, then just because you asked the man to write down 42 doesn't mean he'll tell Carl 42. He may tell Carl any of the numbers for 23, 3, 1, 2, 42, or even 67 that Fred told him to write down after you called in green. Okay. Um, but he could very well tell Carl some other combinations like 23, 3, 3, 1, 67 without ever being consistent with what he told you. It's like he keeps track of which number he has in a little sticky note for each particular thread or person. Okay. And this, in effect, is what it means to keep track of a single variable in a relaxed environment. And imagine a farm of cubicles, one cubicle per variable, each with its own modification order that is being kept track of. That is what relaxed consistency means. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here because I want to give Paul enough time. This is, I, have, I have extra stuff. I'll save that for next year. Thank you.